Hey everyone, welcome to the long-awaited return of the PC Perspective mailbag. This is our uh, video series where you guys ask the team here a series of questions and we answer them uh, as best we can. Now, going back to the, the old mailbags that we haven't done in about a year, uh, each mailbag was hosted by an individual member of the team and they answered all the questions. We may at some point return to that if we get enough questions directed towards one person, but as we're trying to get this uh, back going, we had a, a bunch of questions kind of directed at different people and some questions directed at multiple members of the staff. So uh, for this episode, we, we've kind of got a, a mashup of, of all of us participating and answering the questions that you asked. To ask a question for a future edition of the PC Bear Mailbag, just leave a comment here on this video or uh, send us an email or a tweet or head over to our Discord. You can find an invite link to our Discord in all of the podcast show notes at pcpro.com slash podcast. And there's a uh, separate questions channel there for you uh, to ask questions uh, for the mailbag or, or just in general. Uh, if you do want your question answered by a, a specific member of the team, just please be sure to uh, specify that in the question. All right, without further ado, let's get started this week. What is, was that piece of computer hardware that, that you keep in your system until driver support ended or it finally went into silicon hell and heaven and why? Uh, that one for me would be the Ariel Vortex 2. And of course, drivers were pretty grim after, you know, Creative uh, destroyed the company. Uh, but it was, you know, a true 3D audio solution. It had good audio quality. It uh, was ahead of its time in, in many ways. And it's, you know, of course, very unfortunate that they were litigated into oblivion uh, by Creative. And Creative bought up their stuff, and then it was a dead end, and Creative... Yeah, I mean, it's what happens when you have no competition in that area. So that was a, that was a bummer of a deal. And in my case, it's this little Hopog uh, video capture card, the old Win TV which was beautiful because all of a sudden I could use Windows Media Center and record any movies or TV that I wanted and, you know, play around with clear, clear cam and stuff like that. And as we all know, with the incept of Windows 10, you no longer can use it. I keep thinking I'm going to build a Linux machine at some point so that I can use it again. But for now, the poor little thing is collecting dust. Josh Russell asks, what do you think of high frame rate live video movies? I still wish it would happen and people would stop being so stubborn about it because they're weirded out by it because of the standards we've had for so long. I want our displays and our content to be Windows, damn it. Um, that's a good question. You know, one of the problems that, that people have is, you know, what they call the soap opera effect of, of these high frame rate videos and movies that... You know, it, it looks weird just because we're so used to 24 frames uh, that are refreshed up to, you know, 72 frames in, in uh, well, 70, yeah, refreshed 72 in the theaters. Um, of course, that's different now. With uh, 4K, you do have some stuff that is up uh, higher. It depends on the movie. I can't remember. Didn't uh, Peter Jackson uh, film some stuff at 60? And, uh, you know, some good editing, filters, whatever. I think it can take care of a lot of that stuff. The thing that really bugs me, of course, is when 24 frames per second content is, uh, like, put up to 120 hertz. Um, you know, when, when uh, you know, you have that effect on your TV, which, you know, is, is more optimized for, like, sports stuff. But then they, they put it on a movie, and people look kind of strange, and... Um, Special effects look really, really funky at that. And you've, you've probably seen that. Like, stuff at 24 looks fine. At 120, it's just like that looks really cartoony. It's bizarre. But um, it's going to happen eventually. Times will change. So will tastes. I think we're seeing a lot more 30 stuff. It's a step up. We're going to see more 60. I mean, IMAX has been doing 60 forever. So... It's going to be interesting to see. I just, you know, maybe in the next 10 years, it'll be a lot more common. Maybe if Peter Jackson gets going with uh, some of that Halo stuff, I don't know, that, uh, that it'll be a little bit more easier on the eyes. People understand it more. I don't know. Uh, Turtle Paul asks, I bought a Ryzen 7 1700X and X370 motherboard when they were first released partially because of the promised upgrade path. AMD has really delivered on AM4 upgrades. 
Recently, Micro Center had the 2700X for 130, but I missed that sale. My question, do you think an 8-core Ryzen 3000 parts will be similarly discounted next year? Is a discount less likely because Zen 2 is TSMC 7 nanometer instead of the less popular Glofo 12 for Zen Plus? A cheap 2700X is tempting, but if a 3000 series price coming down the next year, I may hold out rather than doing multiple upgrades. I primarily game. But next year's Xbox and PS5 may be faster than the 1700X, which would could increase requirements for future games. Um, yeah, you know, the 72, the 2700X is a reasonable upgrade from the 1700, just because you get some some higher burst speeds, uh, and that's going to have a positive effect on gaming. If you remember, the 1700X was was the lower uh, burst part and uh, minimum as compared to like the 1800x which is the top end and you know i i think if you found a 2700x for 130 again you're going to be happy with that upgrade uh you also have to check your motherboard for uh 3000 compatibility because i've seen a lot of tests and and the 3600 not even the 3600x but the 3600 is as fast if not a little faster than the 2700x so Prices will eventually go down, but I don't expect to see anything drastic until at least summer to maybe fall of 2020. I could be wrong, but I think uh, Zen 3 is is going to be a later part of 2020 rather than another like spring refresh what we had uh, this year. Well, it wasn't a refresh, it was a major launch, but anyway. Yeah, I mean, the prices will eventually go down, but I don't... I don't see that happening. I mean, you're going to get a couple of flash sales here and there. I mean, keep your eye out for maybe a 3600X. Because, again, I think uh, you'll you'll get a little bit better gaming performance and uh, smoother for, for not a whole lot more money than a 3600. But people have the opposite opinion of mine and think that the 3600 is really the the best price performance of, of the entire group. Up to you. But I like the 3600X. Mirror PPC was Intel 7400 series Xeon's response to the multi-core AMD Opterons in the multi-CPU, multi-core enterprise space. Most likely. I mean, you know, th- workloads change over time. And, uh, you know, towards the end of the 2000s, um, we're getting a lot more servers that, that require more threads. And so the, what, 7400 series was the 6-core, I believe. Um, you know, AMD... Had the four module, eight core, and then easily they they had two of those on on the big Opteron chip, and so you had eight core, sixteen thread, and even though performance was not great, you know it was it was it was a it was a wide architecture. I mean, it had a lot of threads active to it, and you had you know, memory issues, and you know I had to had to move around and mess around with a lot of that stuff. But uh, regardless, it was uh, you know I I think Intel just looked at the look at the industry and said, you know, this is where things are going. Uh, we do have some competition here, but we can, you know, execute a little bit better. Our product's going to be a little bit nicer. And so then, yeah, they, they just stayed one step ahead of AMD and uh, overall performance was just so much better uh, it's been, been in many, many, many workloads. So, yeah, that is that is what I think. And uh, But, you know, it's a chess game between AMD and Intel. And Intel has so many resources, and uh, they've got lots of different things in the pipeline at any one time. So it was, you know, I mean, this thing was probably planned out for a while, and maybe they expected AMD to be a little bit stronger with the Bulldozer series, but it wasn't. And there you have it. This question comes from Blue2501. Can you guys recommend a cheap but good RAM kit or several for Ryzen 3000? This is going to be an easy one. I'll start off by saying AMD Ryzen 3000 processors support DDR4, 3200, and above. And if you've shopped uh, anytime recently for DDR4, 3200 memory, say a 16 gigabyte dual channel kit on places like Amazon and Newegg here in the U.S., you'll see prices starting at around $60, which is really inexpensive. And among the least expensive of these kits is actually my recommendation, which is from G-Skill. They have a 
a series of AMD specific memory called the Flare X. And Flare X in that $60 to $65 range gets you DDR4, 3200, CAS 16, and in my experience, excellent AMD motherboard compatibility. I've used this memory all year long on both X470 and X570 motherboards with zero problems. So it's kind of telling too that AMD shipped G skill memory. This is the Trident Z Royal that everybody got with the Ryzen 3000 reviewers kit. So uh, G skill seems like a good pick for AMD, especially if you're on a budget. Uh, and the other side of the memory recommendation coin is is a little bit more convoluted, less exciting. It involves going to the motherboard uh, support page from the manufacturer and looking at what's called a QVL, a qualified vendor list that will show you everything that's basically been validated to work with your motherboard. And it's a great place to find the full model number of a memory kit that's guaranteed to work at a, a given speed from a particular manufacturer with your exact board. So if you're ever in doubt, it's not glamorous at all to go through QVL lists and find these long product names, but that is a great resource. And I think those lists can change over time as BIOS updates come down and additional memory can be added to the QVLs. So definitely check those out for your board uh, just for a kind of a fail safe um, recommendation option. Failover asks, I'm specking out a mini ITX build for gaming, no streaming, Plex, etc., and I'm looking at either the 9600K or 9700K. Those are the Intel i5 and i7 processors. The latter has two more cores and a slightly higher boost clock, though a slightly lower base clock, if that matters. Other than the two core difference and minor boost clock difference, is there anything that makes the 9700K faster than the 9600K. Now they go on to say, maybe put another way, is there anything about an i7 chip that makes it inherently faster than an i5 once you factor out the clocks and cores? Now, really, if you think about it, at least in the past, Intel Core i5 processors and Core i7 processors were basically separated by hyper-threading. They'd give hyper-threading to the i7 the i5 would not have hyper-threading, which gives you the symmetrical multiprocessing, the added the added threads. Uh, the the 9600K and 9700K mentioned here, though, are, are a little odd because the 9700K is a Core i7 product without hyper-threading. So for the ninth generation, Intel released this processor, which is eight cores, no hyper-threading. So really, the difference between these two pretty much comes down to cache. The cache size of the 9600K is uh, 9 megabytes. You get up to 12 megabytes with the 9700K. Personally, I think the 9700K is one of the better chips for gaming. That's why I've been using it in our gaming test bench all year. But that's really what it comes down to. The, the more cores you have, the more cache you're going to have access to, all other things being the same. So you'll get a little bit better performance out of that. Nori asks, when companies send you processor review samples like the 10980XE, that's Intel's latest uh, Extreme Edition processor, do you have to return them? Well, so far, no. Uh, I have not been asked to return that processor. In fact, I've not have been asked to return any processor all year from AMD or Intel. And really, I don't think that's uh, surprising. Uh, review samples are sent out to websites like PC Perspective, and we retain them on basically an indefinite loan for the purpose of retesting. So down the road, even though I've done preliminary uh, core i9 1090XE benchmarks, future BIOS updates with mitigations, uh, future security patches, Windows version updates, that sort of thing, will eventually require me to retest the processor uh, to have up-to-date results. So it's, it's a valuable resource that we are able to keep these on hand. But no, AMD and Intel have, to my knowledge, never asked for anything back. All right, Longboy has a question for me. Uh, he says, as a Lebanese gentleman, what are my favorite Lebanese foods? And uh, well, 
probably I would say uh, Fataya is is my favorite. Now I will say that's uh, saying that I, I've I experienced Lebanese foods through my extended family that cooked them for me uh, growing up. Always had aunts and and uh, later cousins who would cook, and and even my wife now, uh, who's not Lebanese, has learned to cook some dishes, and and that's great. Uh, but I've learned that going to like Lebanese restaurants in various parts of the country over the years that. Uh, what we cook in our family as Lebanese food may not be exactly the same as as what might be considered traditional or what's more common, uh, but I will say that fataya is my favorite. Now these are uh, little little pies, uh, generally filled with uh, spinach or or meat, although I prefer the the spinach filled kinds, and they're they're pretty simple to make. Uh, I'll, I'll try to see if I can find a, a recipe that kind of matches uh, the ones that I'm used to, and I'll include that in the show notes here. Uh, another favorite of mine is uh, kibbe. Uh, this is a meat dish uh, that's that's uh, made with uh, either beef or lamb, uh, goat. Sometimes well, I haven't had that in a while. I usually beef or lamb, and it's got uh, it's got bulgur. It's like a cracked wheat that's kind of mixed in, and you bake it and cut it up into little little pieces. And uh, it's it's good hot and cold. That's a good kind of leftover food. Uh, Tabuli is another uh, another one I like. It's, it's a it's a very kind of a, it's a green salad. It's got uh, bulgur again, and it's got uh, tomatoes, onions, parsley. You chop it up real fine. It's got a uh, a very uh, kind of strong but but pleasant taste. It's got lemon juice, olive oil. Um, so it's got this great, very uh, very strong, uh, distinctive taste. Uh, but also, it, it tastes very healthy. It's you know it's a good lot. It's mixed kind of mixed vegetables. So it's. It's a, it's, it's a good way to, after you've stuffed yourself on, on meat and carbohydrates in the beginning part of the meal, you can eat this towards the end and you feel better about what you just put yourself through. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's a good one to have as a, as a side dish. Well, that's it for this edition of the Mailbag. Uh, we hope you guys enjoyed it. Hopefully it was a nice holiday gift for, gift for you. And uh, like we said, we want to get this going more regularly. In the original incarnation, we did it pretty much once a week. Uh, and then once the uh, site changed ownership about a year ago, we... You know, just didn't have the uh, the time and the resources to kind of put it together, and uh, we want to get get this going. So please, by all means, get your questions in. Leave them here as a comment to this video. Join our Discord and ask over there. Or send us an email, a tweet. Uh, we'd love to hear from you, and uh, we will probably be uh, you know dark for a little while here because we got uh, Christmas uh, coming up here in, a, in about a day, and then the New Year. But we'll be, we'll be back early next year, that first week of January. And we'll have more for you with our podcast, our, our new interview series that Josh is doing, and of course, hopefully uh, more of these mailbags. So uh, from the PC Per family to all of you, please uh, enjoy your holiday. Have a safe, fun, uh, happy time with your friends and family, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>